Welcome back. Still in conversation with uh, the events that are unfolding in the uh, Northwest. Our uh, analyst and uh, public policy specialist, TK Pua, Pua, is our guest here and uh, talking Supra Mahamopelo. So we ended off the, uh, the, the, the previous segment um, referring to the fact that we're going to talk about this new civic organization, or not new, it probably is around for a while, but called the Revolutionary Council. And these are the, these are the guys that are making a big noise for um, the Premier to leave. Now we heard uh, the Premier, we've got the quote in our news and saying basically that he is going to, he's been keeping very, very quiet all these allegations against him, whether it be on television, in the news, uh, in newspapers, you name it, social media, he is now going to aggressively sue them. What do you understand about this, this, this revolutionary council? Well, I, have to, I think you have to put in the context of the province as I think uh, the premier or acting premier, I don't know what we call him now, has actually had the province on a lockdown in terms of he controls most of the structures. So what happened is that certain individuals said, listen, we, should, we cannot operate clearly within the ANC par uh, parameters. Let's maybe create a council of our own where we are, we, we are still diehard ANC members, but we want to be able to have a voice within the ANC as a block. So that's how they came about. Now, when, when he says he's going to sue them, I think we've heard this song and dance before of certain former president used to say, I'll have my day in court and postpone it, then postpone it and postpone it. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm one of those people, I'm a Thomas. I want to first see the docket of him suing, because what's he actually going to sue them for? Because there is an allowance of free speech, yeah. as long as you know you can actually back it up a bit. So I just want to basically see the docket, because I just think basically, this is, I think they all come from, I think the youngsters say, the same WhatsApp group of, we delay, delay, speaks processes of systems and institutions like courts, just simply to delay and delay. <laughs> Let's talk about allegations because, uh, uh, not against the, the, the Revolutionary Council, but from them towards the Premier. Because, I mean, there are so many allegations against him uh, when it comes to fraud, when it comes to abuse of power, when it comes to corruption and maladministration in the province. Uh, and you've described what a wealthy province it used to be and things have really gone horribly wrong in the Northwest. I mean, some describing certain towns and areas as ghost towns where there used to be thriving hubs. What, what evidence is there of the corruption that, uh, that um, Mahamopelo was involved in. And I think that, that's where it maybe it becomes a bit gray because I always tell people legal issues are complicated and that it's not what you know, it's what you can prove before yeah. the law. And yeah. I think that's what really makes it very complicated. Now, they, it could be true or it could not be false. And I think that's where maybe uh, we have to kind of always exercise a bit of discretion. But then key indicators I'd use is to say, since he's come in, what have we seen? What, did, what have the AG reports actually have said about certain municipalities? I think you would know that as you go towards the north of a uh, northwest province, there's certain places where you don't get water. There's actually people live on tankers of water. And obviously, that's a tender system. So maybe that's that's where they might be pointing towards. But I think I'd rather see the proper legal documents and process to say this is what he's been accused of doing. Because what tends to happen when people keep throwing in he is corrupt, he is corrupt, is that people actually, they, they actually become quite excited to say, wow, the law is going to work. And the longer it drags itself out and the longer they don't actually see this happen, they start to question, do we all, are we all equal before the law in South Africa? Or are certain people being put a special basically people we don't touch. So I think it's always advisable in those situations that, listen, the ANC literally or even the South African government should actually expedite the issue of saying, let's actually investigate these allegations because that's what they are currently very quickly. Because the longer we wait, the more people start to believe that, listen, if politicians in this situation, the acting or current premier, is allowed and we see our, basically we see our living conditions not improving and we can maybe pinpoint it towards him, if he's allowed to get away, why can't I now start deciding, listen, the law works for certain people, why can it not work for me? And they start to basically do their own thing, hence even the protests and the nature of protests in South Africa. Now, I'm not saying people must go out and start looting, but I think it just comes from a place where people say, listen, everybody tells us that the law of South Africa, the constitution of South Africa works, that if we go with our grievances, things will work in A and B situation. But we tend to find that when we do the things the right way, people don't listen. Yeah. So, but when we start burning things and we start highlighting, that's when then presidents people, come back from London. And then they listen, exactly. Okay. Now, Let's wrap this up and, and finally, some of the biggest allegations coming out, and yesterday this is all we really heard, was um, some of the factions and his supporters coming out and saying, this is all because um, there, there was no support from Ramaphosa during the electioneering and that he was a firm and Kosa Zanat Lamini fan and uh, uh, he was a very 
big advocate for uh, our former president, Jacob Zuma. I mean, this is very reminiscent of what happened to our former president, Jacob Zuma. Everything seems to be playing out the same way. And these are the factions of the, the, the Ramaphosa group that just want to see him go and take control. Can we believe this? I mean, is that, is that really what's being played out here? I think there's many things you can attribute to the current president, Ramaphosa, but one of them is I don't think he's quite a, as a political tactician as that. He tends to be somebody who sticks to the letter of law, even if it seems as though he's dragging his feet and it's taking forever to sort certain situations out. And I think, look, they, I always say, they know their gallery. This person and the accusations, they're not playing to the majority of South Africans. They're playing to the core base. And when you go to your core base, you need a certain narrative and a situation and the story, and the story always needs to go, and I think President Jacob Zuma mastered this, where he says, look at me, I'm the poor victim, these people who are in power are not giving me a fair shot, and then we know how the story basically ends. So I always say, look, they're not playing towards the gallery of the whole of South Africa, they're playing towards their constituency, and the constituency likes to hear this. And the only thing I'll say about this is that one of the things I think which really shows that this country has got a loss and a lack of leadership, it's the issue of how you use poverty, I call it weaponization of poverty. You, if you look at the people who actually support them, who actually come out, when you speak to them. Some of these people are mostly unemployed. Some of these people especially tend to be women who basically have, I think they, they're kind of stuck in a situation. And there is always this messiah who comes through. So instead of actually addressing the issues of poverty, there's a lot of politicians are feeding off it. And I think that's actually more detrimental than anything else. Because my understanding, if you're a leader, is that, listen, you're there to uplift people. Now, how you uplift them, to what level, I think we, that's how we should judge you. But the fact that you keep using people's true grievances of poverty says to me that, listen, you you really do need to look at yourself. And I'd never put morals and ethics into politicians, but I think maybe the bigger question needs to be people of Northwest, without looting and writing, how do you actually address the situation? Because politicians are not going to help you. No, nope, there you go. TK, thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, TK Pue is a public policy analyst talking to us about the events at, in the uh, Northwest province. Let's take a break. We'll have the news at 7 for you after this. Okay.